What's up YouTube, Jason Tome here, and today we're talking about what the best binoculars are for hunting. I've got 13 binoculars here that I've tested, and uh, I'm personally looking to upgrade, which is why I wanted to do this video. I've been using these Vortex Diamondback 10x50s for the last four or five years now. I've really liked them, they've done well for me, but I bought them when I didn't know that much about binoculars. And so these 10 by 50s are a little big and heavy for what I like to do. And also binocular technology and manufacturing technology for the glass has improved a lot, which is something that I found out doing this binocular review. This video is about if uh, spending the extra money is worth it. I've bought all these binoculars with my own money, except for um, this pair here, the Vortex Vipers, which a friend let me borrow. None of the companies here have sent me any of these binoculars. So I chose these binoculars by uh, a few different ways, but mostly it was just me going online and looking at what other people recommended and cross-referencing a bunch of those articles and videos. Once there was uh, multiple sources pointing to the same type of binocular, then I would buy those binoculars. Um, there wasn't too much about what the best binoculars were for hunting. A lot of the reviews I was looking at was um, binoculars for birders and um, for wildlife. So what I did was based on those wildlife reviews is I bought a bunch of binoculars that I thought would be the best for hunting so that way I could test them out for myself. This review also doesn't cover long-term use like I said I've gone through them the last three weeks now but that being said most of these binoculars have really good warranties if you did start to have some issues with your binoculars there's a good chance that uh, you'd be able to return these binoculars and get your money back or get a full replacement. So the next thing that I want to talk about is how to choose binoculars. Choosing binoculars is a very individual thing. Um, it's going to depend on what you're hunting that will determine what the best hunting binocular is for you. But there are some general things to know about binoculars that once you know you can apply to your specific situation and that's what we're going to be going over right now. So first let's start by talking about the uh, zoom. So the zoom or the power of the binocular is that first number that you see. Uh, like for example on a 10 by 50 the 10 is going to be the power of the binocular it's going to be how far that binocular uh, zooms in those higher powers are good because you can see further but there's also some drawbacks because when you have more power your field of view is smaller so you can't see as much of the landscape and they don't let as much light in so in general the higher zoom you have the worse it's going to be in low light and the more focused your vision is going to be for the purposes of this review it's mostly just going to be 10 power and lower and so that brings me to my next point, um, which is the objective lens size. So you can see here that the objective lens, or just the lens size, is 50 millimeters here. It's pretty big compared to 10 by 42s. So it has these have the same zoom, which is a 10 power, but these binoculars have a bigger lens on them. So that's important to think about when you're buying binoculars. So you might be thinking, well, I'll just get the 10 by 42s because they're a lot smaller, they're a lot lighter, and they can see just as far as the 10 by 50s. There's actually a big benefit to having bigger lenses, and that's that it allows for more light to come in. So that way you can see better in low light situations. So these are both 10 power binoculars. A uh, binocular with a larger objective lens size is gonna be able to see better in the dark. So you might be thinking, okay, well now the 10 by 50 sound like the right choice for me because as a hunter, I need to be able to see in low light situations. So the 10 by 50s are probably what I'm gonna want. But 10 by 50s actually don't see as well as 8 by 42s do in the dark. Just dropping that magnification down too helps the low light performance a lot. So there's actually a really simple calculation you can do to figure out the low light performance of the binoculars. It's called the exit pupil size. All you do is you take the objective lens size and you divide it by the power of the binocular. So for 10 by 42s, you would do 42 divided by 10 and you'd get 4.2. And for 10 by 50s, you'd do 50 divided by 10 and you would get five. Five is a higher number than 4.2. So 10 by 50s should be able to see better in low light situations. And then these 8 by 42s, if you do 42 divided by 8, you get 5.25, which is higher than the 5 that you get when you divide 50 by 10. 
so that tells you that the 8x42s can see better in low light. But you have to take these numbers with a grain of salt because there's more that comes into play. This calculation would be effective if everything was on an equal playing field, um, but there's more to take into consideration to get you low light performance, unlike the quality of glass, and we'll, we'll jump into that a little bit later. Another thing to think about when you're buying hunting binoculars is the perceived handshake you'll get with uh, increasing the magnification of your binoculars. So you'll always have the same amount of handshake, but um, you'll perceive there to be less handshaking going on with an 8x42. It's not nearly as noticeable. Once you start getting up to that 10 power, a handshake becomes a little bit more noticeable because you've got that extra zoom. And then if you have like a 10 by 50, that adds even more weight. So on top of perceiving more shaking, you're actually shaking more because it's a heavier binocular. And then once you get up into that 12 times magnification and higher, it's pretty hard to use those binoculars without having some kind of a rest on like a tripod or um, a tree or something like that. So now that you understand a little bit more about magnification and objective lens size, it's important to talk about the quality of the glass that's being used because you can have a 10 by 42 that sees better in low light than a 10 by 50 if the quality of glass is really good. So that calculation that we used earlier was to determine the low light potential, all things being equal across binoculars. But once you start getting more expensive glass, light is able to pass through that glass a lot easier than the lower end binoculars. And if there's less light deflection, then that light is able to make it to your eye easier, uh, which allows you to see better in low light. And so that's really where binoculars start getting more expensive, is the process of making glass more clear. And so you'll notice a lot of binoculars will have ED or HD or UHD uh, in their title, and that's just the quality of glass that they're, they're using. Although it's important to look for that, it can kind of be misleading because it's not all created the same. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but just know that the better glass you have, the more light um, will be able to make it to your eye. So that's why you're able to see better in low light. Let's jump into the actual review. I've got 13 binoculars here and I rated them using 10 different categories that I thought would be the most valuable for hunters. If you're interested in that, you can check out my blog and that goes into more detail. But in order to save time, I'm just going to go over the main points of what I liked and what I didn't like about each binocular. For this review, these binoculars have been organized from least expensive to most expensive. Least expensive being in the front, going to most expensive. Um, I've broken them down into three categories. So I have my under $350 binoculars here. I have my $350 to under $500 binoculars here, and I have my $1,000 plus binoculars here. So I have um, seven binoculars in this first price range, I have three in the middle price range, and I have three in the most expensive price range. So the first binoculars that we're going to talk about are the Vortex Diamondbacks. These are not the HD versions, these are the old, older model. Um, I really liked these binoculars when I got them five years ago. They had really good reviews back then. After trying some friends' binoculars out, doing some research, I figured out that glass quality has increased a ton. And from what I was researching, um, it looked like that just the manufacturing process getting a lot better at being able to create high quality glass. And so for that reason, uh, you can get a lot less expensive binoculars now that are really good. I thought it was important to include these into this review even though they were much worse than all of these other binoculars because the technology has changed that much. I know these binoculars were rated really well back when I bought them um, but they've been replaced by the new Diamondback HDs which are so much clearer. They've got pretty bad edge-to-edge -edge clarity. You've pretty much got to be pointed right at what you want. Also the adjustment knob is quite sticky which I'm not a fan of, but that's just personal preference. But they've held up really well over the last four or five years. Really good build quality. It would be much more worth it to buy any of these other binoculars for just a little bit more money than it would be to buy one of these older model binoculars. So the low light performance on these binoculars was also not very good, and these are 10 by 50 so they should be pretty decent. But the Nikon Monarch 5s that are 10 by 42s which should be worse in low light, they were actually quite a bit better, and that's because they have uh, much better glass clarity compared to these older model uh, Vortex Diamondbacks. All right, so I just wanted to jump in here real quick and uh, review these Diamondback HDs. When I first recorded this review, I didn't have these binoculars, and it felt like the review was lacking because I wanted to be able to compare these newer Diamondback HDs versus my older Diamondbacks to see what the difference would be like. So what I found was that everything was definitely better with these newer models. 
And uh, if I was going to compare these to a binocular that I've already done the, a review on, it would be the Nikon Monarch 5s. The only difference being is that these binoculars are a little bit heavier than the Nikon Monarch 5s. They do seem like they're more durable and they've got a better grip to them where it's not like that eraser feel like the Nikons have. And these are also $50 less than the Nikons, but they're a very well-rounded binocular, um, which is something that I've noticed Vortex is really good at doing. So overall, for their price, um, in the lowest tier price range, these were one of my favorites. Would have been interesting to test out some of the 8x42s against some of the other 8x42s I had, but I bought the 10x50s so I could compare them to my older model 10x50s. So anyway, these binoculars were really good, very well rounded, and for their price, they're not a bad purchase. They're a little heavy, a little bulky, um, so if you plan on doing a lot of walking around or long treks, um, you might want to think of a lighter option, but overall, I'm pretty happy with these. So the next binocular that we're going to talk about are the Nature DXs um, by Celestron, I think is how you say the name. These are 8x42s. They were alright. They were definitely better than the Diamondbacks. They didn't have great low light capabilities. The focus knob is a little bit looser, which I like. The one thing that really got on my nerves was the eye cups. They are very loose and they adjust really easily. And so sometimes even if you're just like putting it on your eyes and then you move a little bit to the side, it'll cause one side to go down a little bit and then you'll put them back up to your head and you won't, won't notice why you can't see out of them clearly and it's because uh, these eye cups have moved on you. Or even if you just set it down in the seat and then pick it back up or whatever. Didn't really like that. They had okay clarity, there's nothing to brag about. But these are the cheapest binoculars, but for the price, I think these are under $200, like $190. These binoculars aren't bad for the price, but based on this review, I think you can do better by spending just a little bit more money. So the next binoculars we're going to talk about are the Athlon Midases. After reviewing these binoculars, I really like them. Uh, the eye cups have a very good click to them and they stay where they're supposed to. I was honestly quite blown away by how well they saw in low light. Um, they've got very good clarity. They have a 426 field of view, which is the highest out of any of these binoculars that I've tested, which is awesome for being able to see the surroundings and really see a lot with these binoculars. I really like the uh, focus knob because it's quite loose and I'm a, I'm a fan of having a, a very easy to adjust like a one finger adjusting knob and this had that. I don't know if it's just me, but I also like lens caps that, that go on the inside of the lens instead of wrapping around the outside. But anyway, comparing these binoculars to more expensive models, these outperformed a lot of them. So because I really liked these uh, Athlon mices, I looked up Athlon online because I'd never heard of them. I just wanted to learn more about these binoculars and it turns out that they're phasing these ones out, which is too bad because I like them so much. But in, the, in their place, they created these Athlon Midas G2s. These are a little bit more expensive, but they seem like they are better. So basically it does everything that this other Athlon Midas does, except that it might be able to see a little bit better in low light. It also feels just a little bit lighter, but they're the same size. So the next binocular in the price range are these uh, Nikon Monarch 5s, and these are the 10x42s. And I was actually impressed by how well they saw in low light. Um, they did much better than the uh, Diamondback 10x50s even. Even though the 10x50s have a bigger objective lens size, these are really lightweight as well. But since they're so light and they're a 10 power, they were a bit shaky in my hand a bit jittery or at least the perceived jitteriness was there i feel like just a little bit more heft to them not much but just a little bit would have helped calm down those like little micro jitters a little bit more but really that wasn't that big of a deal the biggest issue that i did have with these binoculars though is the grip it's kind of gotten a racer feel to it so you know how like erasers get a bunch of gunk on them any kind of oil residue from your fingers uh gets all over these binoculars and over time i feel like that would just get kind of gross and because it has that eraser type texture to it, um, it's really easily scratched. So if I take my nail and I just scratch the edge of this, it, um, it leaves a mark on it. And so I'm not really sure about the long-term durability of these binoculars. They would still work. I just get the feeling that the, the grip, which covers the whole entire binocular, is going to get worn off. It is a really good grip though. Like you don't feel like you could drop these. They, they almost like stick to your hand but they do have that downside of uh, leaving marks and uh, leaving residue. But other than that, I like these binoculars and I was surprised how well they did for uh, 10x42s. So the next binocular here is the uh, 
Celestron Trail Seekers. I was kind of excited to get these in to test them out because of how inexpensive they were and how much people were ranting about them. But I didn't think they were really anything special. They didn't have very great low light. The eye cups were definitely better than these Celestron Nature DXs. They did have a little bit more clarity. They were able to see just a little bit better in low light than these Nature DXs. But overall, these Trail Seekers were only slightly better than these uh, Nature DXs. I would say that these uh, Trail Seekers were a very average binocular. Everything about them was average. Nothing was great, but nothing was bad, you know, so. I think these binoculars would be much more competitive if they dropped down their price a little bit. And these are the Maven C1s. And I actually really like these binoculars. And this is the most expensive binocular within that uh, $350 range. I think they were right on the, right on the mark of being $350. They feel just really good in the hand. The eye cups are just really nice. They got three settings and they stay right in place. And the focus knob is easy to turn with one hand. They do have the lens caps that go over the lens, which I'm not as big of a fan of, but that's just a personal preference thing. But the glass quality is really nice. Um, they have a really clear image. You see very well in low light situations. They're very comparable to these Athlon Midas's. It was hard to determine which binoculars that I like better. Um, they both did really well. The only thing that really annoys me is the metallic noise that the adjustment knob makes. And that's just, that's not even my fingernail. That's my fingernail there. So as a hunter, having something metallic like that that's going to make a bunch of noise is not going to be okay with me. Imagine something hitting that while you're in the field. I mean, that's just going to make a lot of unnecessary noise. So all in all, I really like these binoculars. They do everything really well, but that adjustment knob is just really loud and metallic and annoying. All right, so we've been through all the binoculars in the under $350 price range. This middle group here is the $350 to $500 price range. And the first ones in this category are the Zeiss Terra EDs. And I really like these binoculars. They did really well in low light. They were comparable to the Mavens and the Athlons. They've got a really good grip on them. The one thing that I didn't particularly like too much was that their eye cups are pretty tough to twist. which isn't a huge deal, but I prefer to be able to quickly be able to twist it and have it snap into place really easily. I also didn't really like how these lens caps were on the binoculars. I found them getting in the way when I was trying to look at stuff, trying to get them out of my face and everything. They do on clip, but I do like having uh, lens caps on them for protection, so I didn't want to have to clip and unclip them all the time, but their focus knob is easy to use. They've got great clarity and uh, they're really good in low light. These next binoculars are the Endeavor ED4s, um, 8x42s. I was not a fan of these binoculars at all. Their eye cups, when they got cold, they were really hard to, to move. It almost feels like I might have had a, I might have a faulty pair. Uh, I don't know, this, this focus knob just works really bad, especially with uneven pressure on the knob. So if you're trying to do it with one finger, it doesn't work well. You almost need like two fingers. So I didn't like that. Um, the clarity wasn't great. It didn't it didn't work well in low light. Being able to open these binoculars up takes quite a bit of effort to go back and forth. Um, they're just like a very sticky binocular. On top of that, they didn't seem to have a very good performance. So um, wasn't real happy with these ones. And the next ones in the line are the Vortex Vipers. These are also the 8x42s. And I did like these quite a bit. They did well at everything. Um, they didn't do everything like great, but they did everything, I would say, just slightly above average. And their build quality was really good. So I really like these binoculars. It's really nice to have a pair that didn't do anything that was annoying. Because most of these binoculars that I've tested, there's been some little cork with them that was just kind of annoying to deal with. And these didn't have any of that. And on top of that, their low light, um, edge to edge clarity, all that stuff was slightly above average. So this group of binoculars that we're going to talk about is the $1,000 plus. And, uh... These are the Maven B2s, and they are 9x45s, not 8x42s. And the reason why I got 9x45s is because they didn't have 8x42s that would be able to make it in time for this review. But I still wanted to test out the B-series glass and compare it to the C-series glass to see how much of a difference there was. Um, these are about $350, whereas these are about $1,000. For the price gap difference, 
you can definitely see some difference. Is it worth it? Not for me, not for what I do. Um, these 8x42s work just fine. But if you were looking to upgrade and get something a little bit better, um, some cons for these is how big they are. They're just a big binocular. You can see the size difference uh, between the two. So they've got a little bit more weight to them. They also, again, have this metal. I think these ones are even louder. Other than that, can't really complain about these. They're crystal clear. They do everything really well. All right, so the next binoculars we're gonna talk about are the uh, Vortex Razor UHDs, and these binoculars are awesome. Nothing to complain about with these other than their size. They do everything really well. They're better than all these other binoculars, except for possibly these Maven B2s. I mean, they're definitely better in the sense that they don't have this loud noise, um, but if you take that off the table, they're pretty comparable. They're just about the same size, but th these are 9x45s, so the Mavens should be a little bit bigger, and they do feel like they're a little bit heftier than the, uh, the Vortexes. Vortex Razors had a little bit of an advantage in low light and clarity, which would make sense because these are 8x42 binoculars, whereas these Mavens are 9x45s, so just mathematically, they should be like slightly better. So overall, these were a pretty comparable binocular. You got a little bit more range out of these Maven B2s than the Razer UHDs. So if it wasn't for the size, these binoculars would definitely be my favorites. They're just impractical for the type of hunting that I do. I like to do a lot of walking and I like to have my binoculars be pretty lightweight. But if that's not important to you, they're just all around awesome binoculars and highly recommended if you can afford them. All right, so the last pair we're gonna talk about are the Swarovski EL 8.5 by 42 binoculars. During my research, what came up time and time again were how good these binoculars were. They were always rated number one. Um, so I knew I needed to get my hands on some of these uh, in order to compare them to the rest of these binoculars and if a uh, $2,200 pair of binoculars are actually worth it or not for hunting. Based on what I found, these are definitely the best binoculars, including uh, these other two higher end ones. And so for $2,200, you can definitely see the difference. One thing I noticed with these binoculars is that they do a really good job at zooming in and out of brush. Another thing that I really liked is how easy it is to change the focusing of individual eyes. All you have to do is uh, use your left eye focus on something till it's perfectly in focus and then you close your left eye and then so you're only looking through your right eye and then you just pull this dial up focus knob up and then you can micro dial in your right eye so it's perfectly in focus and then you close it and then now your binoculars are perfectly focused for both of your eyes. So I really liked how easy it was to do that. The next thing is these are amazing in low light. The glass clarity is really amazing. It's, they're a really good size, they're really nicely balanced. Um, they're definitely smaller than these other binoculars. These are slightly bigger than your 8x42s, but not by much. So that's the difference there. But the, uh, the bins are pretty straight, which these bins are not straight. You can see there's a little bit of curvature to the bottom of the, of the lenses. They get a little bit bigger down there and wider, whereas these are straight the whole way through. So they're a little bit more compact. If you're looking to get the best binoculars possible, these would be the ones for you. All right, you guys, so we've been through all the binoculars and I've chosen my favorite binoculars from each price tier. On the under $350 price range, the Athlon Midas G2s were definitely the top binocular. So I hadn't, there was really no complaint to these binoculars. They did everything really well and actually better than I would have expected for how much they cost. Also, in my opinion, these binoculars did better than the binoculars in the mid-price range, and that's something I'll get to in a minute. But also, these are the older model Athlons that are still on Amazon right now. They do everything basically the same as these binoculars. Um, they're just maybe a little bit heavier, and they might not be able to see in low light situations as good but pretty much the same so these are i think you could save 50 dollars by going with these so if you're looking to save a little bit extra money definitely check that out you're not really losing anything by buying this older model in the mid tier i chose the viper hds as being the best they were definitely better than the vanguards which i was not very happy with the zeisses were close to these um, i think the zeisses probably did a little bit better in low light than these vipers did but Overall performance and build quality and function was just better with these Viper HDs. Um, so that's why I chose these to be the winner of the, the binoculars between $350 and $500.
that being said, I still think that these um, Athlon Midas binoculars did everything just even slightly better than the Viper HDs. So I would choose these binoculars over the Viper HDs. And then we have the Swarovskis, and they are clearly better than these Athlon Midas G2s. They focus better, better at adjusting, they are more comfortable and balanced, they feel like they're just made better. They are a little bit heavier, these are, these are lighter, and there is a little bit of a size difference. So these would win in being more compact, but the glass in these was just uncomparable. But for hunting, there's really no need for me to have something like that. These binoculars, for the price, do everything that I would need. So for that reason, these Athlon Midas G2s, in my opinion, are the best hunting binoculars out of these 13 binoculars that I tested for their price. They even outcompeted the more expensive binoculars in the $350 to $500 price range. You could definitely spend a lot more money and get some really nice binoculars, but um, for me personally, I'm just looking to get the most bang for my buck. And uh, these G2s were definitely, definitely the way to go. If you guys are looking for a little bit more in-depth information on how I chose each of these binoculars, or how I ranked each of these binoculars. I wrote a, a blog article going into more detail, so if you want to check that out, uh, I'll leave a link in the description below. So anyway, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, I'd appreciate a like and subscribe. Um, if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, just leave them in the comment box below, and uh, I'll do my best to get back.